health savings and flexible spending accounts make for a nice crossover between money and medicine. This is not a personal finance podcast at all, but when I'm done with today's theme, you'll be able to take advantage of benefits good for your health and maybe even your pocketbook. Your well-being should be about thriving instead of surviving. It's about time to empower yourself and to navigate our healthcare system with ease. My name is Rishi and this is the show, Friendly Neighborhood Patient. The main concept here is that health savings accounts, or HSAs, and flexible spending accounts, or FSAs, have pre-tax money that you can spend on various healthcare items. I'm not here to give you tax or investment advice, but I do want to point out a bunch of facts about these plans that are helpful. Most of the time, you sign up for either plan via your work. The HSA is easier to understand, so we'll start there. With this account, you or your employer make tax-deductible contributions, which you can use for things like medical visit copays and prescriptions. A couple neat facts about HSAs are that your unspent money generally rolls over every year, and that you can invest those funds like you would an IRA or 401k. This all sounds wonderful, but there are some limits, with the major constraint being that you can only qualify for an HSA if you have something called a high deductible health plan. I've talked about deductibles before in past episodes, but the short story is that your insurance might require you to spend a certain amount of money out of pocket before coverage applies. The IRS defines these plans as having a deductible of $1,400 and above for individuals and $2,800 for families. This is why HSAs are helpful because if you're already spending money for medical help to begin with, you get a little tax relief on top of that. The max amount you can contribute to an HSA in 2022 is $3,650 as an individual or $7,300 for a family. These numbers change every year based on inflation and the IRS's assessments. Whether you get an HSA through an employer or in some cases fund it yourself, the institution or bank who keeps that account will usually give you a debit card for your medical expenses. Even if you have or don't have an HSA card, but you have an account, you should keep receipts for anything you buy with that account so you can easily lock in whatever reimbursement you need as long as the money goes towards something eligible. Thankfully, you can find lists of eligible medical expenses from both the IRS and HSA bank websites. I'll link both of those resources on my post at rishinagala.substart.com. It also doesn't hurt to check the original HSA or FSA plan document you get at the beginning of the account creation to see the specific expenses that are okay for reimbursement. Some employers have more or less restrictions on what you can use the money for beyond whatever the IRS suggests. You don't need to have a high deductible health plan to get an FSA. Only an employer, though, can give you an FSA. The confusing part happens when you realize there is more than one type of FSA. This is just classic healthcare making life complicated, but I'll ma- break down the major kinds of FSAs regardless. Although your average medical FSA can fund medical costs like the HSA, some companies offer a limited use version with money that can only be used for dental and vision care. You might also see a dependent care plan or DC FSA that is meant for child care, elder care, or some preschool services. It's actually possible to have both an HSA and FSA. In that situation, your FSA would be limited to vision and dental or dependent care facilities. Unlike the HSA, though, you can't roll over all your unspent funds here. The IRS has a 20% contribution rollover limit for FSAs every year, but your employer makes the final decision on what is okay. Because of the pandemic and the recent American Rescue Plan, there are exceptions in place, so you can ask your tax preparer about that if needed. For 2022, the contribution limit for a traditional medical FSA is $2,850 for individuals. DC FSAs have a $5,000 limit for individuals, but are also subject to change. If you have the luxury of being able to choose between an HSA and FSA, you should think about your medical habits and tendencies so you can make the most of either plan. Regardless of the account you have, keep your receipts. If you ever need to send them to an administrator, your reimbursements will be easier to get. For example, you shouldn't hesitate to ask for an itemized statement from the medical office or pharmacy you go to often. But before we keep going, let's pump the brakes for a moment. The reason why I'm spending time walking you through all these items is that not 
everyone qualifying for these accounts takes advantage of or even knows about them. The Journal of the American Medical Association held a survey in 2016 and then reviewed their findings in 2020 for adults with high deductible health plans who have or can get an HSA. The main benchmarks here are that the AMA study classified health plans with a deductible of 1300 and up for individuals and 2600 for families. So compared to the IRS's standards, the $1,300 is less than $1,400, $2,600 is less than $2,800 for families. The sample of people who got interviewed here were ages 18 to 64, all of whom had a high deductible health plan for at least 12 months. The results found that just one in three people actually opened an HSA account and even fewer contributed to their respective accounts in the last year. All of this is the case while the percentage of privately insured adults with high deductible plans went from 25% in 2010, to 40% in just 2016. In essence, patients are paying more out of pocket, but aren't taking advantage of HSA or FSA benefits when you know they can, so those issues can get offset. These trends are why I want to call attention to the fact that it's worth your time to check with your employer or tax guy if you qualify for these accounts. Just remember that if you actually get an HSA or FSA, save your account policy document and your receipts to make the reimbursement smooth. No matter how you choose to spend all that hard-earned tax money, that expense should be done at a clinic or facility that treats you well. In the next post, you'll learn how to spot all the red and green flags of medical clinics. Subscribe and stay tuned to Friendly Neighborhood Patient for more healthcare commentary. I'll catch you in the next episode.